Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Natural disasters and campus tragedy, September 11th, Katrina, Virginia Tech and Delaware State, and then most recently, Louisiana Tech and Northern Illinois, all highlight the need for colleges and universities to improve their capacity for crisis management and emergency response. The new mandate for campus officials is to anticipate the unexpected. Hello and welcome to Ready to Net, an interactive roundtable for conversations about information technology issues that affect planning and policy in higher education. I'm Casey Green the director of the Campus Computing Project and host for today's program. Our Ready to Net program today brings together a college president, chief of police, campus technology and telecommunications officials, and a technology provider for a series of conversations about campus crisis management and emergency response strategies. Our program today will have two segments. We'll begin with a conversation about the context of campus crisis management and the next steps in campus po policy and planning the evolving lessons that emerge from the crisis experience at individual institutions and campus communities. The second segment will explore some of the technologies campuses are using to address emergency notification and communications. Joining me for the first segment of today's program are Diane Harrison, President of California State University, Monterey Bay. Diane, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Fred Hardy is the Chief of Police for California State University, Monterey Bay. Fred, thank you for joining us today as well. Jerry Semmer is the Executive Director of ACUDA, the Association for Communications Technology Professionals in Higher Education. Jerry, welcome. Ready to net. Thank you. And Richard Seisdek is the Director of Computer and Telecommunication Services at Bryant University in Rhode Island. Rich, again, thank you for joining us at thank Ready you. to Net. Welcome to all. And we want to begin this program by acknowledging the tragic events in February at Louisiana Technical College in Baton Rouge and Northern Illinois University. Sadly, the campus shootings last month at these two institutions highlight the theme of today's program that crisis management must involve efforts to anticipate the unexpected. And I should add, in the interest of full disclosure, that the planning for this Ready to Net program on crisis management and campus security began long before last month's events in Illinois and Louisiana. Diane, any campus crisis that involves the loss of life is obviously a, a huge tragedy and a college president's worst nightmare. Is there really any way for a, a campus community, for a college or university to anticipate these events, be they caused by weather, an accident, or violence? Well, you can anticipate that there will be something mm -hmm. and plan for it as carefully as you, as you possibly can using all of the best practices that we know. Unfortunately, with recent events, each campus learns lessons, mm -hmm. valuable lessons from those. And, and one of the, the most important lessons is the, the need to plan, mm -hmm. to plan, to uh, test your plan, to yep. communicate your plan, to get your campus aware of your plan. Can you avoid disasters or emergencies? No. Uh, but you can certainly be better prepared than we have in the past and uh, continue to improve and never let your guard down mm -hmm. and think that you're ready because uh, you're, you may not be. It's, it sounds like this is very different than some of the other planning that we do in higher education. That too often we do plans, the plan exists, sometimes it exists in real life, sometimes it exists on the shelf or on the web and we go on to the next thing. You're talking about a very different, almost iterative process. Yes, and it's, and it's a moving target because, mm -hmm. uh, again, we have a, a very significant plan, very thick binder of mm -hmm. plan, uh, and yet every time there's another event, we learn, we fix, we modify, mm -hmm. we improve. It's a constantly moving target, mm -hmm. and you can never be too vigilant about it. Great, thanks. Fred, you know, the notion of, of a chief of police you and your counterparts meeting regularly with a college president, senior campus officials on a weekly or a monthly basis, seems almost like a throwback 
to the days of campus unrest a generation ago, except the context has changed dramatically, hasn't it? It really has. Talk about that changing context for a little bit. Well, really, the, the context, uh, Casey, is such that uh, that communication has to be ongoing mm -hmm. at all times with uh, many areas of the campus. Yeah. Uh, and fortunately, at Cal State Monterey Bay, uh, President Harrison has made this a priority mm -hmm. on our campus uh, based on uh, incidents that, that have occurred nationwide. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for everyone on the campus mm -hmm. to realize that emergency preparedness has to be a priority. And it could, it could range from the most unfortunate incidents that you described just a couple of minutes ago to natural disasters right. as, well, as well. We're, uh, we're an earthquake country in California, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And really the preparedness can range to a multitude of incidents that, mm -hmm. that can happen. And fortunately at our campus, uh, very recently, uh, we had our emergency prepared, uh, preparedness manager fall under the umbrella of the University Police Department as well, where in prior years uh, that individual reported to another area. We worked together very closely, but those are things uh, I use as an example mm -hmm. about how things continually change and you have to be able to change and be flexible with it. What are some other examples of sort of the changing alignment, whether it's organizational or just even informal communications that you've experienced in this context over the last two to three years, even pre-Virginia Tech? Well, I, I think a big part of that, Casey, is, is that uh, many campuses uh, across the nation, uh, prior to some of these significant incidents happening very recently, felt that it couldn't happen to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, things can happen anywhere at any time, and, and we've learned from that. And it is key to learn from other institutions that have experienced these unfortunate incidents and be able to communicate mm -hmm. issues and preparedness and be upfront with your entire campus community so everyone is prepared mm -hmm. when something like this does occur. Uh, Diane? I was just going to say, I think one of the most important uh, changes and improvements mm -hmm. that we have made is the um, initiation and regular meeting once a week of our care team. Mm -hmm. And we've always had a care team, but we have now expanded and um, really taken on the seriousness mm -hmm. of, of what that is. Those would be professionals from student affairs, right. student life, campus security, uh, anybody and everybody that mm -hmm. has a, a tie-in to students and, and potential uh, issues that could arise. Does that also include an expanding network of off-campus security personnel in, ter in terms of Monterey Bay and the county? What it, what it does really is it does include uh, surrounding mm -hmm. law enforcement agencies and uh, we have also had uh, regionalized training in the event of emergency preparedness and right. we have brought in many law enforcement mm -hmm. uh, officials from throughout our county, from both uh, municipal agencies, county agencies, state and federal agencies uh, to train regarding emergency mm -hmm. preparedness on our campus. Jerry, let me turn a little bit. You represent an organization, you lead an organization that's at the telecommunications professionals in higher education. Uh, you know, it used to be we think about emergency notification, it was the phone tree in one sense, or could we send a message out over a PBX system to all the landlines on campus. That environment has changed dramatically, obviously. Uh, we've got now new providers with new technologies, particularly for emergency notification. It almost seems like there's an implied mandate for these things. You know, does your campus have it in the wake of, of Illinois, Northern Illinois, for example, there were stories in a number of sources, CNN.com, uh, Chronicle of Higher Education, almost uh, dissing, and what, not dissing, but you know, since once it's chiding Northern Illinois to say they didn't have a system. Is this part of the new rising lowest common denominator in this environment? Well, Casey, I believe that there is a mandate, an implied or inferred mm -hmm. mandate. And I believe that most higher education institutions feel a tremendous responsibility to protect the health and safety of mm -hmm. their campus community and their surrounding communities. Um, I think that the recent tragic events have just brought more urgency and more focus to this issue mm -hmm. from parents, from mm -hmm. students, from university employees, mm -hmm. and from our public policy makers mm -hmm. at the state and federal levels. Yes, I feel that there is an urgency. However, I, I also think that we need to recognize that there's no single technology solution mm -hmm. that is the panacea because there are so many different types of incidents and emergencies that can occur on mm -hmm. campus. And I think that it's very important, and our members recognize that technology is a very important component mm -hmm. of this, but there are a number of other high-tech and low-tech mm -hmm. 
methods that need to be used in concert in order to inform mm -hmm. as many people as possible with accurate information. Rich, this seems to be another example of lots of moving parts. Diane and Fred talked about new kinds of committee structures and organizational arrangements mm -hmm. that might have been different today than they were several years ago. Uh, increasingly dependent on technology services. You've been engaged in a project at Bryant that is not only the campus, but involves essentially the community adjacent area. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Can you talk a little bit about how the, the notion of this expanded net or responsibility goes not just campus, but, but beyond the campus a little bit, and sure. the activity at Bryant. Sure. Um, if, if you look at the taxonomy of mm -hmm. an, an event, what, what really occurs are three things. Uh, event identification, event notification, and event response. Mm -hmm. We use technology to try to shrink that time to action from uh, detection mm -hmm. to response. So we implemented a interoperable collaborative network on mm -hmm. campus. What we did is we saw the value in that, in, in extending that out to communities, mm -hmm. primarily public safety agencies in, within the local communities. Mm -hmm. To date, we've extended it out to eight communities in northern Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. We've crossed the border into Connecticut. So this is not just campus adjacent, you're actually providing a service. We're providing a service. Uh -huh. uh, we, we know, as everybody does, that incidences do not respect property lines. Right. So the safer we can make the community, the safer mm -hmm. in turn we make our campus. It's a system of interoperability mm -hmm. where first responders, and I, and I know the chief can attest to this, it's yeah. very critical that they interoperate during situations of mutual aid. We've extended services out to the communities to allow them to do this. We've crossed borders into Massachusetts, mm -hmm. within Rhode Island. We've extended these capabilities to E911, uh -huh. our PSAP center, the Rhode Island uh, Emergency Management right. Agency, and the American Red mm -hmm. Cross. Interesting. Let's come back, Jerry, to your point about the technology. You know, it's one part of the solution. I'm remembering when, when computers started showing up, you know, campus labs, this became every campus had to show the lab whatever the resources were. Mm -hmm. Is this, a, are we back to this again? You know, whether or not it's a sophisticated system or not, we're going to start almost seeing some sort of seal on campus websites. We have this. You can find this plan publicly. Jerry, let me start with you. Well, I believe that, mm -hmm. um, the community, mm -hmm. uh, the legislators, and parents and students are going to be looking at this right. when they evaluate mm -hmm. what institution mm -hmm. their um, son or daughter, mm -hmm. for example, should uh, attend. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important question that parents will be asking at orientations. I think it's an important issue for employee health and safety. Mm -hmm. So I think it will, it will, um, this is going to be kind of a, a metaphorical issue. security blanket to know yes. that there's a system there. And, and that's an interesting point. You know, but the data that we've collected with the campus computing project say that for many campuses, a lot of the, the first wave of put, cobbling these things together is what do we have on the shelf? We've got email, we've got landlines, we can put something on the website, maybe there's a siren system. Diane, I, you know, how much of this is, is the next step? You know, where, are, where are we in the evolution of these things? Well, I, th I think the theme here is that you need redundant systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, my fear is that uh, parents or students or right. faculty or staff will have a false sense of security mm -hmm. that, for example, if you have a text message right. system that you are 100%. We know that uh, not all students sign up for the text message right. system. That's a big issue. This um, is the issue of opt-in or opt-out. Yes. Is it mandatory or is it optional? Right. Yes, we have, to, we have to deal with that. Uh, some parents aren't signing up, some employees aren't, so th that's mm -hmm. one issue. It's not a synchronous system necessarily. Mm -hmm. If you send out uh, a text message, mm -hmm. you can't be guaranteed that every person who is to mm -hmm. receive it will receive it in a timely manner. Uh, so there are a lot of, there are a lot of questions yeah. that remain, and uh, I do think, though, that people will expect that you have certain systems set mm -hmm. up, but we shouldn't think that one system is going to be the end all and be all. You need multiple systems. We talk about email, we right. talk about phones. If we're in a natural disaster in our area, it's the power gone. goes out. Yeah. Uh, we have a very spread out campus. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to need multiple systems for emergency mm -hmm. notifications. But, but Fred, also, isn't it the case that there are limits to what, like anything else, that there's a limit to what the technology can do? I mean, at the end of the day, it's really about human factors and human planning. You know, isn't the easy part really buying the technology? <laughs> The, the easy part is buying the technology if the funds are in place, Casey, uh -huh. so that could be a challenge we'll as well. We'll come back and talk about money in a moment, because <laughs> for a lot of campuses, this has not been part of the budget of late. S certainly, right. but uh, the world that we live in, yeah. uh, people want information real time, and, mm -hmm. and I think that that 
is the challenge that that's faced mm -hmm. with uh, university police departments uh, nationwide and uh, from all indications at some of the locations mm -hmm. where some of these uh, unfortunate in incidents have happened uh, the the information has been mm -hmm. released in a pretty timely fashion yeah. uh, but you really need to be able to balance that versus uh, timeliness and appropriateness mm -hmm. of whatever yes. the incident mm -hmm. is also because what we don't want to have is an overreaction on mm -hmm. campus to where there's hysteria created over something that might be a false alarm yep. if you will uh, with the uh, the extreme situation yes people want to be notified promptly timely and if it's appropriate mm -hmm. but at the same time we don't want to get into a situation to where we're uh, un unneedlessly mm -hmm. locking down a campus and uh, closing mm -hmm. uh, the campus for the day when something turns out to be uh, perhaps maybe a false alarm. Well th this really raises an interesting issue about this 30 second rule that's being discussed in Congress and perhaps in some of the state legislatures. Jerry you and I were talking before we, we came into the studio that there's resistance among that among Fred's counterparts saying that this 30 minute rule rather mm -hmm. you know it may be a well-intentioned effort on the part of, of legislatures and the Congress to say we're doing something, but it's not necessarily a wise uh, decision in terms of the realities that Fred just discussed. Is that true? Yes, I believe that our uh, national and state legislators are, as you say, very well-intentioned mm -hmm. in reacting to these uh, situations by attempting to impose a regulatory solution. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe that that is an entirely practical approach because there are so many different types of incidents mm -hmm. that can occur on a campus, uh, from a hurricane to a tornado to a, a violent crime incident. Yep. And I really believe that qualified professionals on the campus, mm -hmm. and that means an interdisciplinary team from the highest administrative levels mm -hmm. to uh, senior law enforcement officials to the technology officials, need to make the decision as to how to release, when to release yeah. information, and Question what the risk. scope right. of mm -hmm. information release will be. As opposed to just pulling the trigger and sending Absolutely. out the alarm. There's no yeah. one size fits all when it comes to mm -hmm. an emergency incident, and I believe they need to have that flexibility. And, and Rich, you're not just a technology user, but Bryant now becomes a, a technology provider, as you were talking about the work that you're doing with off-campus communities. Mm -hmm. That's correct. In, in that context, how much training for the issues that Jerry and, and Fred and Diane were talking about in terms of the coordination, the communication, the priority, and the limits of the technology are you involved with in terms of dealing with now constituencies that are your clients as well as your own community at Bryant? Mm -hmm. Training training is a big issue and, and just to collaborate on what Diane and, mm -hmm. and the Chief said earlier, uh, preparedness is a requirement for yep. crisis management but really instruction, training, and drilling mm -hmm. is essential. Mm -hmm. Well, the other part of this too is, is how, do you, how do you cut through the clutter? Isn't that the case? I mean, students are walking around with all these devices. Again, the, you know, if you look at the newspaper headlines or the, the online headlines, as if the, the emergency response systems are the, the panacea for all this. Students don't look at their email. We know that. Whether you know whoever it comes from, the university, from their parents, all they you know they run to their social networking sites. Students have multiple email accounts. You know, it, it, what you know, in terms of what you're doing at Monterey, for example, Diane and Fred, how do you help students and other members of your community understand this one matters? When, when well, the, those are very good questions, mm -hmm. and we still try to answer them every week. Uh, we are currently in the middle of doing a survey among our students, uh -huh. asking them, in an emergency, what is your most preferred method of, mm -hmm. that we communicate with you and so far the majority of students are saying text messages. Mm -hmm. The second is phone. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact but, is... But it's a cell phone, it's not a, mo it's not exactly. a landline. Exactly. Right. Well, we, we still have students that haven't signed up for the text mm -hmm. message even though they're indicating that's their preferred. So right. it is a moving target and again back to redundancy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, it's probably a fair guess if not an understatement to say that, that the kinds of technology responses that are being offered by providers or campuses are reaching for that they didn't have prior to Virginia Tech were not in anybody's budget a year ago and certainly in many cases not in institutional budgets today. And yet, again, because of this implied mandate, because of the public pressure, perhaps because of some of the news headlines, there's going to be, we better buy this thing. Even again, as we've, you seem to agree, buying the technology is the easy part. Diana, as a president in a state that's got its own very publicly acknowledged budget uh, challenges, Fred on a campus that's part of that, Jerry thinking about your association and your constituency, and Rich, how do we deal with the money issues in this thing? Because we're not talking about small sums of money. Richie, let me start with you because you're in that sure. nexus point of both, you know, you're, you're con buying these technologies, but also in one sense you're a provider of these technologies. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing about the, sort of the crunch? Well, let me say what our next steps are. Uh -huh. um, 
rather than looking to bring in new technologies, we're really looking to how do we better leverage what we have. Okay. First thing we're looking to do is take those physical safety systems, such as your access control, your video surveillance, right. even your fire alarms, alarm systems, converge them with our information and our information delivery Unified systems. Unified command and control? Yes. Okay. And, and Jerry, you know, again, what you're hearing from members of your association about the, you know, what's involved in terms of the, the providers coming to campuses, how we do the budget stuff, what are campuses doing these days? I mean, wh where's the money coming from? This is not found money, but they've got to find the money. Well, first of all, when we did a survey last July at our annual conference of approximately 400 mm -hmm. attendees, uh, they indicated about, a um, little over half of them indicated that the drivers for implementing um, an improved emergency right. notification system was senior administration. And uh, while the funding is an issue, I think there's prioritization that's mm -hmm. being done on the campuses. And I have to agree with Rich, there's quite a bit of, bit of technology already in place mm -hmm. that can be utilized for these purposes. Mm -hmm. I think the money is um, going to be available. For example, in the recent uh, Higher Education Reauthorization Act, there are provisions in that bill for grants and loans mm -hmm. to um, help with emergency preparedness on campus. That's a potential source right. when that legislation but that's is take, passed. It's got to be authorized. Correct. The money has to be appropriated. You know, certainly the federal yeah. government's having its own problems, let alone the individual states. Mm -hmm. That's two years before we see any of those grants potentially mm -hmm. in terms of actually sure. money trickling down to campus. Diane, you've got a problem. You've got to have something tomorrow, metaphorically. Yesterday. Yesterday, right. <laughs> uh, you know, what's being, you know, this, this kind of triage that Jerry talks about, you know, some of that money has to be found someplace. Right. I think that uh, certainly campus safety and security yeah. is a top priority and, and fr not only from a uh, philosophical standpoint, mm -hmm. but, but from a budgeting standpoint. Mm -hmm. And we were fortunate that our technology folks were ahead of the curve and already having available for us a text message system. Right. We reconfigured it and repurposed it so that now it is only used for emergency mm -hmm. messaging. And uh, so we were able to, to leverage that resource. But I think certainly, you know, you could, you could make a very long and expensive mm -hmm. wish list for, uh, for security devices. And uh, we have that, and we are slowly picking our way through it as our resources permit. We're looking at what is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we going to improve what we have? And uh, on the recommendations of mm -hmm. my chief of police, who is an expert in, in these areas, then we will make our decisions. Fred, sirens, email, messages on portals, landlines, uh, notification systems that go to cell phones, off-campus residents, text messages. What else is part of the mix that that, that has been missed in part of the public conversations to date? Well, I, I think the issue, Casey, uh, and I believe Rich said mm -hmm. it earlier, is, is that you have to look at your existing systems and, mm -hmm. and then be able to adjust those to whatever your needs are. Build on the base. And, mm -hmm. and uh -huh. be fluid with that. Uh, something that we actually just uh, uh, got around to purchasing was uh, earlier this week we placed an order for uh, an emergency alert system, uh, an mm -hmm. exterior uh, public address system. Right. And, and the challenge that, that we're faced with at Cal State Monterey Bay is the fact that we cover almost 1,500 acres. Right. And that's a fairly large area for an external alert mm -hmm. system. However, we did some research and uh, discovered a system that would, would work well on our campus and uh, for a, a pretty affordable price as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a wireless system, right. and it could be, uh, it could be installed uh, fairly easily mm -hmm. by our uh, on-campus facilities department, and it was something that we felt was necessary mm -hmm. to add to our already existing system when we talk about redundancy, mm -hmm. even though initially it appeared that with the uh, large area that we, we have on our campus that uh, it might not be possible or it might be too costly. Yeah. There, are, there are systems out there that, uh, that can be affordable mm -hmm. and uh, we actually had the ability to, to come up with the funding within mm -hmm. our own budget instead of budgeting for it and have it happen right. that one, two, three years out like you, like you described. We, we can't be in that mindset any longer mm -hmm. because things are so dynamic, they're changing all the time and uh, we have to be able to adjust and, and modify our existing to uh, systems. To what you needed it yesterday. Exactly. Rich, what are we not asking in this conversation? I, admittedly, the conversation sort of drifted because emergency notification systems now seem to be sort of the public icon of this conversation about crisis management and response. Are there things that we need to, in the conversation we're having right now, 
that, that have, we need to address that we've not touched on? Well, I, I, can, I could give you an example of something that we, we had on. to do on campus with our, our, our crisis management team, and mm -hmm. that was, I, I think it was really key for us to, to cultivate a culture of cooperation right. and collaboration mm -hmm. within that team. You're talking about breaking and, through and the traditional it, it, organizational it, it, silos? Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. And that really, that, that spirit emanates from mm -hmm. that group to the rest of the organization. How did you do that? Was that a matter of a, a president or a senior campus official saying children get along? Or in fact, was it the, the, the issue was so large that they realized that we have to put the silo mentality away? I think it's a little of both. A little of both? Yeah. Jerry, what aren't we asking? Well, another area that we haven't really spent much time on is um, hurricane preparedness, uh -huh. and uh, because I, those um, well, about natural disasters, yes, at natural large, yeah. disasters in general, mm -hmm. and hurricanes specifically, which really brought into focus, um, were brought into focus with Katrina and Rita, mm -hmm. and well, also we recently, uh, what happened with tornadoes in Tennessee? Yes, right. absolutely. The, the, the campus, and we recently completed a major. Um, effort with a national task force mm -hmm. working with the telecommunications industry association to develop a preparedness plan that um, w emphasizes multidisciplinary mm -hmm. approaches on campus. Is this a with, template that, so, that yes, others can is. look at? Yes, it is. It's actually okay. a checklist okay. that involves the facilities departments, mm -hmm. law enforcement, and very critical coordination with your service providers in the technology area. Mm -hmm. You need to know what backup systems are available from the cellular and the uh, local issues, exchange yeah. carriers that you work with. Mm -hmm. What resources will they have immediately available to your campus? Mm -hmm. I think coordinating with your vendors is almost equally as important as coordinating within departments and among departments on campus. That's great. Fred, what are we missing? Uh, you, you come at this with a very different perspective than those of us who are faculty, administrators. What, what, what are we missing in this conversation? Well, Rich, uh, Rich touched on it. I, I think it's really mindset. Mm -hmm. it, it's mindset uh, w from everybody on campus, starting at the president mm -hmm. all the way down to the students. And uh, also keeping in mind that uh, a, a national incident management system, the NIM system, mm -hmm. actually can work for, for many emergency situations uh, within our campus community. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not specific to uh, a campus lockdown or an uh, uh, un mm -hmm. unfortunate incident of a school shooting. It, uh, it really is, uh, covers that whole umbrella of emergency preparedness. And what it does is it gets everyone on the same page. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the key really too is, in addition to having the mindset, you also have to have the training that goes with that. And also the, uh, the exercises, be they uh, tabletop exercises, uh, a, a campus-wide uh, mm -hmm. mock disaster training session, or even having the ability to uh, call up your emergency response team unannounced yep. and ask them uh, how long it would take them to get to their uh, emergency operations center. Those things need to be in place. They need to be on the front burner, mm -hmm. and uh, everyone needs to take uh, preparedness seriously. And Diane, you get the last words. What are we missing in the conversation? Well, I, I would say the best laid plans mm -hmm. aren't necessarily the best laid plans. Mm -hmm. And that, that regardless of the technology, there are human elements. Mm -hmm. uh, you have your team set in place and three people are out sick with a cold or flu. What happens then? Right. You need backup and then backup again. Okay, the redundancy, prepare for yes. the unexpected. Great. My thanks to the four of you, to our panel members for this first segment, Diane Harrison, Fred Hardy, Jerry Semmer and Richard Sizek for their insights and perspectives about campus crisis management and security. We'll be back in a few minutes to continue our conversation focusing on emergency notification and communications. Welcome back to Ready to Net and our program on crisis management and campus security. In the second segment of the program, we will focus on emergency communication and notification services. In the week following the tragic events at Virginia Tech last year, many campuses scrambled to develop crisis management plans. 
A growing number of institutions acquired emergency notification technology that allows campus officials to send voice and text messages to landlines and cell phones, to email and via text messaging. The intent of these systems is both immediate contact along with duplication and redundancy. If we don't get the message to you at your desk or residence, we can reach you via your cell phone or email. Our panel members for the second segment of the program are Lev Gonick, CIO and Vice President at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Gil Gonzalez, CIO at California State University of Monterey Bay. Shannon Meadows is the Vice President for Higher Education at the NTI Group, a provider of notification technology services. My thanks to the three of you for joining us today. Lev, I want to begin the conversation with you because Case, sadly, actually had a direct experience with a campus shooting some years ago in 2003. An angry employee walked the halls of the university's business school with a gun one Friday afternoon, sadly killing one person and injuring two others. You were at Case at the time of the incident. Help us, because you've had this real world experience, help us really understand what happens when that first call comes in that there's a gunman shooting people on campus. Well, Casey, we begin with the playbook, mm -hmm. and then we start calling audibles. Yeah. And that's very much uh, the experience uh, that we had uh, when in the Peter B. Lewis building on campus, uh, the incident that you mentioned uh, unfolded. Um, certainly uh, in an urban campus setting mm -hmm. such as ours, we're also very much involved in making sure that we have a coordinated uh, action plan. Uh, immediately, uh, the university president mm -hmm. and the mayor of the city actually took command, con command uh, posts per the playbook. Uh -huh. um, and uh, then we realized that this particular setting, the Peter B. Lewis building, is actually a Frank Geary right. uh, uh, architecture made for some extraordinarily difficult uh, mm -hmm. uh, audible calls because of the actual architecture of right. the building. Uh, but from a, certainly from a technology perspective, uh, early on, uh, what we were able to do was to get notices out of the building from uh, faculty who were hiding under their desks and sending IM to us uh, to actually give us more intelligence than uh, certainly in those early minutes uh, than we were actually able to get uh, when we realized that our two-way radios wouldn't penetrate the Geary uh, uh, building mm -hmm. uh, along the way. And, and you mentioned the, both the playbook and the audibles. In, in, the, after words, in the assessment afterwards, when you went back, how much of the playbook was actually, did you have to go back and revise? You talked about the radios. We've, we've heard this in a number of situations with emergency communications and, and emergency providers. Other things that, again, the emerging lessons from the experience at CASE? Well, from a technology perspective, again, uh, you know, the, the effort and the playbook is actually developed by campus security, uh, as was in Fred in, in your previous uh, panel set. Mm -hmm. uh, from a technology perspective, there were a couple of things that we, we learned. Uh, certainly we were pleased that the uh, notification made possible through email and IM served us well. Uh, what we did realize is that at the same time, uh, as was unfortunately the case uh, just a week or so ago uh, in, nor in Northern Illinois, actually digging up information in real time about the, either the, uh, the person uh, who is either the, per uh, the perpetrator or in fact uh, the potential victim, getting information in real time about the people in you know, who are at play at that moment uh, turns out to be something that we actually have a critical contribution to make in terms of our information systems that are out there and not having to rely necessarily on uh, the specialists uh, in the IT shop at giving our customers the ability to be able to probe and Access harvest that information. in real time. That's sure. something that we uh, modified our playbook on. Mm -hmm. Gil, uh, Monterey Bay, like most institutions, has been fortunate not to have an experience in terms of a disaster, uh, weather, uh, accident, tragic of campus event. And yet at the same time, Monterey Bay has also recently acquired a notification system. Talk a little bit about sort of the planning. We heard a little bit from Fred and Diane from one aspect of it in the previous segment. Talk a little bit about sort of the planning and, and the decision process that went in at Monterey Bay. Well, <clears throat> well selecting an emergency response was not on our playlist uh, a couple years ago. In fact, we were looking at really how students want uh, communication handed to them, uh, understanding that their communication strategies are fundamentally different than ours. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we were looking at companies that provided OS a way to communicate with them uh, to their mobile devices. So the, and we were really experimenting. We were ahead of folks. We weren't really trying to get emergency response. We were trying to get communication to students to help them uh, do everything from get notification about their instructional uh, progress to receiving information about clubs, receiving information about activities on campus. Uh, so we were really trying to get content out to the form factors that students really wanted to have in their hands. And we wanted to have some of that landscape so we could use it for institutional purposes. Uh, the terrible incident happened at Virginia Tech uh, 
uh, allowed us to redeploy that, reconfigure that system to match our needs. And since then, of course, uh, every other CSU in the system has said this is part of the tool set we have to have. I think uh, as we go forward, it really is about the IT organization kind of being aligned with what the institution's needs are in the sense that we really have to get the landscape that the students are interested in getting on those handheld devices, particularly as they get more fully functional. Uh, iPhones are a great case for that. So we've got to get into those tools. We've got to provide information to them in a way that makes sense to them. Uh, we hope we never have to use it other than for testing, of course. But of course, we believe we should be able to communicate with them and, and get them the data they need. Shannon? NTI is a provider of this kind of technology. It was doing this kind of offering these services well before the events at Virginia Tech. You're on the other end of the phone that started ringing, I assume, after Virginia Tech, and it's probably been ringing since then, particularly in light of events in Louisiana and in uh, and Northern Illinois. What do you hear when you get these calls from campus officials? What are they asking you about these response systems? Again, and I think it's important to, to state, notification seems to have emerged as the icon of all this. There's lots of other things and lots of other moving parts, but again, so many campuses and also off-campus conversations have been, got to have an emergency notification system. Well, I think a big part of the focus is SMS messaging. That is something that campuses feel is the best way to, to communicate with their students. And so there are a lot of questions about how accurate it is. There have been a lot of experiences that campuses have recently had uh, that have uh, pointed out shortcomings with SMS or helped people learn more about the different aspects of SMS. And so those are some of the questions that we've been getting. Mm -hmm. Lev, we're now five years after the events at, at Case in the Peter B. Lewis building. As you sort of think about the technology then and the kind of technology on the market now, what, what, what would, you know, what, where is Case moving on this, again, given the experience that the campus had and the resources that are now in the marketplace? Again, from a technology perspective, um, we haven't made major modifications to the, to the playbook. We have added uh, mass notification, uh, largely in response to uh, boards of trustee and uh, parents, mm -hmm. uh, not from students, interestingly enough, but, uh, but more from those who have either fiduciary and, and broad responsibilities for the, uh, the perception of, well, of doing well on the campus or the parents who want to make sure that their students are actually being notified uh, if, uh, if, God forbid, this kind of thing sort of uh, happens on campus. But from a technology perspective, uh, we use uh, mass e uh, email notification. We use our voice over IP infrastructure to serve as barkers so that uh, those phones uh, end up uh, turning as loudspeakers. And then we use all the analog infrastructure that exists on the campus uh, in, in, for notification uh, purposes. But the, the, the added slices is, in my view, uh, the mass notification work that, that Shannon uh, and her uh, colleagues in the, in, in the industry provide is a kind of 5% uh, topping right now. And the real challenge, from my perspective, uh, will be not only the topic of how to get adoption, which is the current issue on the table, but really, as Gil was mentioning earlier on, I mean, how can these infrastructures uh, be utilized for the 99.9% .9 of the time that they're not being used for emergency notification. In terms of extending value. Val value, because if in fact, as Gil points out, and I agree with you entirely, that students don't start from email as the premise of their communications environment, um, how can we uh, routinize the use mm -hmm. of this, but at the same time preserve you know, the, the hotline when you need to use it for that emergency which one, notification. Which message really matters. And that's really, yeah. a, that's actually a fairly complicated sociology issue mm -hmm. for us to, to sort through. I don't know what you're thinking. Well, I think, uh, as we know, when students are under stress and something all terrible is happening, they're looking for ways to communicate in ways in which, frankly, we're beginning to understand. So they're going to the libraries. If there's a terminal available, they're logging in, and they're, as you mentioned, broadcasting messages saying, this is what's going on. Now they're using the web very differently than we actually think they're using the web. We think they're using tools very differently than we think. And so again, we've got to figure out what are the best tools to put in place so that we can communicate when we have a specific instance. Lev, you're right, it's about, that, it's about the rest of the life of the student that we think those tools are going to help us with. Under crisis though, and this is where we got all the attention right now, is we're going to have to work out uh, how our <clears throat> major tools uh, eventually fold in this functionality because it's a part of everything that we do know. It's no longer going to be an ancillary. Right. Uh, every tool we have, every ERP, every communication strategy we've got has to have SMS messaging with other functions right. that still are still to be defined. I, I, the other thing I just add, Casey, mm -hmm. uh, to what Gil's saying, is that I do think there's an important piece here that we have to work out with our industry partners because the mass notification uh, offering is absolutely hitting a sweet spot in, in the requirements that we have 
But the truth is, n neither we as campus officers, nor in fact the providers like NTI, actually control the cost to the student right. Right. of the experience, which is to say that it's actually minutes, or you're actually paying for data rates with your uh, cell phone provider. And when the campus wants to roll out the service for the broader u utilization, uh, we get a lot of pushback, which is, you know, I, why should I be well, paying for it, that kind of service? It's a very different, very different set of circumstances as opposed to a phone call coming in on the old phone right. tree right. or email where there's no direct cost. In one sense, you're paying for a service that you may or may not want, that you may or may not value. How do you differentiate between what looks to be spam and what looks really is an emergency message that breaks through all this stuff? Shannon, you're working with your campus clients right. about these issues. Well, well, I think some of the key, uh, one of the key points is in the implementation and training. You have to set people's expectations when you're implementing a system. And part of that is educa education, asking them for their information, telling them why you're going to use it, and then actually doing a campus-wide test call as part of the deployment. And in that, training them that in this case, we're going to be using this in an emergency. You should expect to receive this kind of communication. This is what you should do in response. So people know exactly what to expect. And then on the other utilizations that you're referring to, uh, we've found very, very positive response with those kinds of things in the instances that, that they've been used. I think the important thing is it's the right message for the right person at the right time so that they're getting a communication that they truly want. Let me, let me pick up another part of this though, um, and that is, we're, you know, how do we help students? Gil, I think you, you start open the conversation in one sense saying it's not a matter of what we select and telling the students to do it. It's a matter of understanding the student behavior because that's the largest part of this population and then building these systems on the basis of what students do as opposed to what a group of well-intentioned, you know, hopefully thoughtful campus officials say, oh, this looks interesting, we think this will work. Lev, you affirm that, Shannon, as well. Let, let's come back to that issue in terms of the kind of testing and, and marketing that has to go. I note that the emails, for example, that I now get from Monterey, some campus officials say, have you signed up for Otter Alert you know, in terms of this opt-in or opt-out issue? Let's go back to the student issue again because that's the largest part of it. Gil, you opened this up. Well, uh, I would say there's a couple side issues here that, that need to be addressed, and probably the first one is that the assumption now is the university, because we're trying to communicate through this mechanism, now has to have ownership of the of mm -hmm. the tool. So right now, our discussion is we now have uh, you know, 4,000 new devices we have to support. We are now looking at tools in which we can manage um, the operating systems of phones. Right. That's the first time in a long time someone has said to us, we have to extend that reach into another device that a student carries around. And, we have and to it's do a device that. you have no control over. As of today, we don't. Yeah. But again, I think we're really being asked to begin to look at that because it's, be it's so important. It is, in, in a sense, their identity. Mm -hmm. And once they use the phone for their identity uh, as part of their secret passage into all the other things they're interested in doing, the university wants to be, have a, a participating place in that. So, so I mean, I, I know we, we are absolutely focused in on, on the emergency piece of the puzzle, right. but I think the epiphany is actually that the device around which campus people need to really be thinking about academic use right. and about student life use and about emergency security use is actually the handheld device right. environment. And I think that that really is the big aha. We're realizing it because, in fact, of the emergency situation, but uh, the truth is figuring out how to use it not only for notification purposes, but for transaction services and also more broadly for uh, informational services. Uh, the truth is that for the next three to five years, thinking through that platform as opposed to wireless notebooks or tethered uh, PCs, uh, that will be the big campus challenge and making sure that we as CIOs and other campus officials use the emergency notification wedge to really open up the debate on campus. And that really is a whole mindset difference. I can tell you, for example, the data from the campus computing survey, CIOs say effectively we want nothing to do with cell phones. And that's all going to, for the most part, I'm, it varies from campus we, to campus, and that's going to have to change, Gil. Uh, well, but, we yeah. don't, but again, it's part of the funding but, but model, and part, part of the, of the funding support model, model but, but the, the other part is, model. It's, it's, been, it's an advice you have no control over. It's not like network registration. You have students that are engaged in behaviors before they arrive to campus in terms of what they're buying and how they're using it. The iPhone is going to change some of this, and not just because it's, it's cute or students are buying it, but now we've got another voice over IP device on a campus network as well. Well, I think the, the point, though, is yeah. that the, the Gil started with, we have to start where, where, the, where students the students are, are at, Absolutely. and that was your question. Yeah. And that's the challenge right. for us on campus. Yes, we may not want to own you know, the ecosystem <laughs> right. around the, the mobile phone, but the truth is, because to. emergency notification has put it four square in front of us, we have to work with our partners in mm -hmm. industry, as uh, not only with the emergency notification, but more broadly in the mobile environment, and then to start layering value 
so that we can begin to, we don't have to control the environment, but we have to be relevant to the environment. And, and Shannon, that ecosystem, as you work with campuses, again, buying the technology is the easy part, it's that implementation. Correct, correct. And I think part of it is that students really want a relationship with their campuses. And we've found some uh, very positive things. Um, one example is fee payment reminders. People uh, have called mm -hmm. to remind people that they will be dropped if they don't mm -hmm. pay their fees. Mm -hmm. And in one instance, 44% uh, fewer students were dropped for non-payment in a case like that. So I think that's a great example in which this is a, a very, very valuable tool mm -hmm. and can actually pay for itself at a, on a campus. It can also be fun. I mean, it's another part of this, this, the sort of social experience of around mobility. I know on our campus we're using 2D coding where in fact phones that have cameras built into them, and many, many of them do, are actually now being able to take pictures in front of our theater of uh, an event coming on that is in fact encoded so that when you take a picture, you're clicking on it, and it's taking you to a web experience about that particular production. Well, could we, could we blend that with the <laughs> notification uh, experiences mm -hmm. and other things that relate mm -hmm. to awareness around public security uh, issues by blending notifications with you know, 2D codes and other kinds of technology? Yeah, yep. the, the other options are to begin to use our phone systems as hearing nodes on, an, on a voice network to help reduce costs for the institution, but also extend services. So we actually want to route all of our... Explain a little bit about peering codes. Uh, very much like we do with the universe, with our, our internet and the uh, California Research Network, we create peers with other major networks so our traffic doesn't incur additional costs. So it's a way to keep costs down and improve performance. Well, that same strategy is being laid out in voice systems. So we want our phone systems to be paired with municipal systems and with other organizations for emergency response so we can keep our costs down because we can route all of our traffic for major vendors through those switches. Yep. But the value then is that you can then add services to that, to that user that you couldn't do before. Let's, you mentioned the issue of cost. There's a cost to the student because ultimately the person getting that call or getting that email is paying for it. There's the cost of the systems. Again, we, we talked with the, the previous panel, nobody budgeted for this stuff before Virginia Tech or very few institutions. It's, the money's coming from someplace. There's some sort of triage going on that it, it's transferring from point A to point B, and yet this is now part of the new landscape. Lev, you're at a private institution, Gil at a public institution. The budget realities of doing these things what can we look forward to given the sense that this is now a mandate, and essentially a mandate, implied well, it's or an heard. unfunded mandate, it's to, an, your, uh, right. to, to your point, it's an unfunded mandate. Uh, there's not a lot of contingency built into budgets for it. Uh, I think early on, in, in, again, in Shannon would know better kind of the rhythm of how the product has been brought to market. Uh, it's obviously trying to find a, a spot that works in terms of our available budget. Uh, which is, turns out to be pretty modest and is probably getting smaller than you know the, a lot of people in the market would would imagine. Uh, but the real challenge for us at this point is to is to really be pushing hard from a campus perspective to the vendors that we work with in the mobile space, even if students are buying them with their families independently, to have data plans essentially built in uh, to the acquisition as a highly recommended, much as we do on our campus with notebooks. It's a highly recommended environment, and uh, we are very much pressing the idea that. Uh, if you're coming to campus, uh, not only do you want to keep in touch with your mom and dad and your girlfriend and whatever with uh, SMS and voice, you want to have a data plan built into it so that we can work together with the student community on creating value for them. And the budgeting in terms of just the, the service and the technology at the campus level. Let's talk a little bit about the cost of the student. Gil? Well, I think the other cost is uh, working with our colleagues across the organization. So working with university police, student affairs, some of the other business units that are incurring real costs in terms of stopping something else to support the use of these tools is, is a un uh, recognize budget requirements. So it, it's a commitment of the institution to make it work end to end. And that's the part that the student expects. They don't see all the bureaucracy of the organization. They expect to have these options available to them just like they have in the analog outside of higher education. Shannon, you've seen both sides of the campus conversation in terms of the opt-in, opt-out. Mm -hmm. Some campuses make it mandatory and you have to explicit, explicitly say, I don't want to be part of the system. Others are trying to get students to register. That seems to be the largest hole in some of these systems to be useful for students and others in the community. What are you seeing in terms of how this is playing out in different campuses? Well, I think we're seeing a trend of people going more and more to mandatory participation with a, an optional opt-out. And in those cases, uh, typically people are using multimodal communication, not SMS only. In SMS, an opt-in is required. A great example is the University of San Diego during the recent wildfires. They have about 10,000 people on campus, and they made phone calls to 10,000 people four times. They were closed the entire week of the fires. They had made about, they had about 6,000 of those 10,000 people opt 
opted in for SMS messages. But using all modes of communication, which were phone, voice to landlines and cell phones, email and SMS, they were able to, to success, successfully deliver about 90% of their messages, but they felt that they reached 99% of their population because they used all those modes. Mm -hmm. And that's a great example of full opt, full mandatory opt-in where they've uploaded all their data from their student information system and then people who are just very strongly opposed to getting messages can say they don't want to. We, uh, we're kind of wrapping up a little bit of time, but I want to come back to the unknown. What questions aren't we asking about these systems and these kinds of technologies, either the ones here or the ones that will be emerging? Uh, Lev, let me begin with you. Again, I think part of it is to realize uh, and try to sort through uh, where, the responsibility, where the responsibility lies for what part of the ecosystem. And I think, again, from, from the campus perspective, as we look in addition to questions about how to uh, engage students, faculty, and staff, and in our campus, just sort of as a short footnote here, I mean, it's actually our faculty uh, who are the folks who are the slow adopters, uh, which I know is in contrast <laughs> to some of the other experiences uh, along the way. But you know, for us, it's kind of who, you know, who owns the challenge of sorting through um, the use of this new platform, this mobility platform. You know, where's the strategic thinking within IT, and how does it, in fact, weave through not only public security and public safety, but also the uh, media relations pr group of the campus and the other components, as Gil was saying, and I agree full-heartedly that it's really about weaving the culture of the organization to realizing that it's a new platform. Uh, in terms of other, th you know, the other sort of key piece uh, in the puzzle. Uh, around instant uh, notification is to uh, really begin to, s to be careful around uh, setting expectations appropriate to the ability of the various uh, pieces of the multimodal communication strategy with respect to how much time it takes to get what uh, along the way and be sure that we're reinforcing uh, the pieces and parts and not looking for a silver bullet. That's mm -hmm. the biggest part, mm -hmm. not of the technology challenge, but around expectation setting right. across the campus. But, well, not just off on the campus, but also beyond the campus in terms of some of the legislative okay. mandates we're Absolutely. seeing about this 30-minute rule. Absolutely. You know, we will feel better about legislating this. You're going to have to do it. It may, as we heard from the previous panel, it may be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Precisely. Exactly. Shannon, let me to ask you the same question. What, what aren't we asking? What are, are we missing in this conversation well, I at think, this point? I think there are two key issues. One is um, academic use, uh, which is what you've been alluded, both of you have been alluding to. Love's comment about how do we extract extra value out of these things beyond just right. the narrow band of notification in an emergency. Exactly. And there are are very few people who have really tried using this technology many for that use. People are mostly focused on how do we deploy it, how do we use it for emergency notification, and some people have thought about using it for other things, but they haven't actually tried it yet. I think there's huge value for campuses uh, in, in truly impacting academic performance and retention uh, using uh, the tools in that way. Kind of the way Amazon hits at you to say all the smart kids bought this book and you did, now you want to buy the book that the smart kids are buying next in one sense. Reminders, exactly. kind of in there, to Gil's point, in the way that they work as opposed to the way we would like to work around the systems we're building. And also uh, building community. I mm -hmm. think uh, connecting people to their, fa to their faculty members and to each other in a class in a way that they aren't connected today. Great. Gil, what are we missing in the conversation? <clears throat> well, it's really about identity. I mean, I think it's, at the end of the day, we're using these platforms to deploy content, but it's, it, the individual is giving up something. There's an exchange that's going on. We call it a cell phone number today, but there's more to it. I think the phones and the tools are going to be more complex in the next several years, and that's where we hold our smart card data, and that's where we'll be using to set up our interactions and our exchange. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the longer term conversation organizations in higher education need to sort through because that's the part that will make a big difference and will move us further along in providing better service to our uh, clientele. Great. Great discussion. And that brings to a close our program on crisis management and campus security. My thanks to Lev Gonick, Gil Gonzalez, and Shannon Meadows for joining, this, joining us for the second segment of our program and also to Diane Harrison, Fred Hardy, Jerry Semmer and Richard Sazdick for their insights and perspectives in the first segment of the program on crisis management and campus security. Our thanks as well to the good folks here at public broadcasting station KTEH in San Jose for hosting this program, and also to the corporate sponsors of the Ready to Net series for supporting our efforts to provide you with these Ready to Net programs. For all of us at Ready to Net, we hope you found this program to be useful and informative. Please be sure to check the webpage for this program for additional reference and resource materials about crisis management and campus security www.csumb.edu slash readytonet. On behalf of ReadyTonet, thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Welcome to a brand new day.
Welcome to a place where books rewrite themselves, where you can drag and drop people wherever they want to go, where maps are rewritten, and anyone can be famous, where we're more powerful together than we ever could be apart. Cisco, welcome to the Human Network.